This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest, and her name is Professor Sriyar Radha Data. I have, may not have pronounced it correctly, but I, uh, if I do not, I apologize. She's a professor of Global Jindal University in India, a non-resident fellow Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore. She's the best person to today to tell our audience about what's happening in Bangladesh. She continues to serve on the academic boards of several universities. So my question to you is, what do we start from you? Well, my question, thank you for coming to our show and, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Talking with you. Okay. You are a South Asian academic with a special interest in Bangladesh, a country in that in that many say went through a second revolution recently. Do you believe what happened in August 5 in Bangladesh? And do you think the revolution was expected? And what are the challenges, political challenges that Bangladesh faces today? Yes, there has been many such interesting phrases being used like a revolution. I would actually hold back a little bit on those phrases, but it's certainly break from the past. Uh, break from what has been uh, the tendency of the last government who was there for three consecutive terms. And... Um, yeah, but Sheikh Hasina, the Prime Sheikh Minister. Sheikh Hasina, yes. What is she so, right now? Uh, she's in India just now. She uh, had to leave her country uh, on 5th of August because uh, I think what we know from the public domain uh, is that... Uh, the army chief said that he would not be able to keep her safe because I think there was a lot of local uh, resentment against her and it seemed that uh, the youth would overrun Gondam Bhavan, which it happened eventually, of course, but she had uh, left and she was safely in uh, India at that point of time. So subsequently, as you know, I think from 8th August onwards, um, Nobel laureate uh, Professor Yunus has taken you know, as the head of the interim government, which has now got about 21 members, of which, of course, there are two student members, too, in part uh, for some two particular portfolios. I think the first and foremost, given the violence we saw in the aftermath, not only, I mean, there was this whole thing led to the student and the state uh, security apparatus, the problem that they had, and then, of course, 5th August event. Uh, but subsequent to 5th August, we saw a huge uh, law and order problem in the country, where, of course, the police forces, as you know, have been extremely unpopular, and they went back, and they were not there. And military, of course, wasn't wanting to do anything, given what they had faced a few days ago. So right now, I think restoring restoration of peace, stability, law and order. And as we all know, Bangladesh's economy hasn't been doing well. From the time that Bangladesh was known as that, you know, the miracle growth and all of those things that we talked about. But a year and more, in fact, I would say more, uh, we've seen the economy really go downhill. So right now, I think the government has to address that, has to address the huge corruption that the banking sector saw. So those kind of, I think, are priority. And of course, there are many other factors that they would have to examine, but more importantly, um, give way to a free and fair election. I think that's what the youth would want to see. Since we're talking about the free and fair election, do you think the interim government, uh, led by Nobel laureate Mohammed Yunus, who I know personally, I met him several times in the United States, capable of holding free and fair election in Bangladesh, can he? Can this government help restore law and order? What the future holds for, for its democracy? Does the this development impact the region, and the and in sense the broader global uh, community? Is Bangladesh on the board on the brink of new new democracy uh, uh, the extra new extra new life let me begin with democracy you know one of my first works on Bangladesh I called it Bangladesh a fragile democracy I still believe that Bangladeshis want uh, to see democracy 
Uh, but what we, you know, there has been a history of every particular political leader elected. Once they elected, they trample with the system. And uh, we've seen how judiciary, legislature, everything kind of gets, you know, under the cloud. And uh, so that is something which I, again, as I said, this 5th August was a breakthrough moment. We really hope that they'd be able to kind of get the systemic problems in place. In fact, they will address the systemic problems, which is what uh, we just referred to earlier. But I think elections is something that Bangladesh would certainly want, either multi-party elections, which we didn't see the last couple of years in Bangladesh. So I do believe that it has been troubled in for the last several decades, just not now. But Bangladeshis, I think, yearn for uh, multi-party, free and fair, democratic uh, standards and norms to be established properly. Do I, you, I would do you totally... think they're going to get a democracy and, and, and they're going to restore the law and order, this fellow? Yes, yes, certainly. I think, you know, I'm just going by the precedence of the previous uh, interim government who, uh, it is known as the caretaker government who overstayed. Uh, but they were able to restore a lot of the problems that the, you know, the polity was facing at that time. This is a period of between 2006 to 2008. So we actually saw Bangladesh in 2008, December elections for the first time have a extremely clean voters list, uh, a separation of you know, organs of the government and many other positive elements which were introduced by that particular caretaker government, which is certainly backed by the uh, military. But this time it's a different nature. We still haven't seen any timeline. Uh, we know that interim government would suddenly want to hold free and fair elections, but I am not having seen a timeline from them as yet. And I'm not sure what is it that they want to do. As I said, priority would be to restore peace and order, get the economy going. But how many things can they tackle? Or how many things would they just want to address in the immediate context and then have elected government, uh, you know, take over and address many of the other systemic problems that Bangladesh has been uh, uh, faced with in the last couple of decades? There are reports that Bangladesh students who led the recent uprising to oust Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's autocracy. She, is, she was a pretty much not a, she was an autocratic ruler, just like Modi is in India. Sometimes some people feel that way. I shouldn't be saying that, but I did. Uh, and if I did, I apologize. A plan to start a political party to end the country's d domination by two political parties led by two women. Do you believe it's a wise move? Certainly. I would actually think that this is a good time to break this completely, you know, dynastic politics that Bangladesh has seen ever since. Well, and the one also led by uh, Sheikh Hasina's father, was a, yes, was a, but also Khalida Zia, if you recall, yeah, right, BNP right. was done by Zia Rahman, and then it's Khalida Zia. And of course, uh, her son is sitting in London right now facing a lot of charges, so I don't know. But it's it's both the political parties, the two main political parties are very, very steeped into family hierarchy. Uh, and that binary, so both the dynastic politics and the binary of only two political parties I think this is the break. And if the students can, only they will be able to. So I do certainly hope, uh, you know, what you're suggesting, that they have their hopes and aspirations for new political parties to come up through the movement uh, that students have led. I would certainly look forward to that because that would actually, uh, you know, enable a far more greater level playing field for every political actor and stakeholders in Bangladesh. How will the Bangladesh changes impact the political dynamics in South Asia, in particular the ties with India? You know, the Modi and, as I understand, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister of Bangladesh were good friends. Do you think the Bangladesh will remain a, a, a democracy? Yes, I think so. I mean, I don't doubt that. And I think that's what the youth have been talking about. But I think in terms of relationship with India, it is true that Bangladesh um, uh, Awami League has historically been very close with India. Sheikh Hasina has been a you know very old friend of India. She stayed here earlier, if you recall, when assassination of Mujib took place, uh, when she was not able to enter Bangladesh. She was here for six, seven years. So clearly there's a, you know, a long, deep, uh, friendship that exists between India and Sheikh Hasina. And Prime Minister Modi, as you say, has also carried on with that. So while that aspect is also true, but I do believe right now we are sitting in that kind of a crux where in South Asia or elsewhere, there's an interdependence which has grown. And while Bangladesh 
India is certainly, and I think Prime Minister Modi has said this many times that many of India's uh, international ambitions, inter, you know, what it wants to do, its its goals, all of that is also taking Bangladesh along with it. And much of that in terms of regionalism, cross-border facility, transport, infrastructure that we are building needs uh, Bangladesh's support, which Bangladesh is very ably given under Sheikh Hasina. But also Bangladesh, as you know, India, um, you know, uh, issues the highest number of visas in the world for Bangladeshis, which is essentially on medical tourism, but even otherwise. And also in terms of the economy, as you know, Bangladesh's main, um, one of the major contributors of its growth story is the ready-made government, which is all right, goes right, towards the government. The and they come to the United States also. Yes, uh, exactly. Europe. United States, EU and other countries where they earn a lot from that. But a large portion of that industry is also supported by the raw materials they buy from India. So I'm just saying oh, okay. on various levels, Bangladesh and India are interdependent. And I think the youth would want to see, uh, you know, lies, which is something that they see, they want to see a better future, a more positive future. And that only lies in working together. I, I, I'm always convinced about the fact, and I go to say it again, while at this point of time, while I'm speaking to you, if you just open Facebook or any of the other social media, you'll see there's a lot of anti-India you know, rhetoric going on in Bangladesh, which is natural because it's a reflection of, they're very angry with what Sheikh Hasina, you use the word autocrat, she certainly was. And, you know, she suppressed many voices. So clearly there has been anger and resentment. And since we are so closely aligned to her, the anger also has been on India. I mean, it's a natural fallout. But I think one sense prevails, one temper school down, they will see the dividends in working with India. Uh, that I think sh is, should not be lost on the youth. And I have, I've been, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of these interviews these student leaders have done. They're so impressive. I mean, every time I hear somebody, it's, I, you know, they, they actually have a vision for Bangladesh. And I'm sure yeah, they yeah. understand that, you know, a, a healthy, robust Bangladesh is possible when it, you know, works with his neighbors closely also. And India is a very important neighbor for them. Tell me a little bit about the the population of Bangladesh, and and what is what are the main industries they focus on, and why why the the relationship between the United States and India, as well as other countries, should be a cornerstone of their democracy. Well, ready-made garment industry, of course, is the main you know focus and they're now trying to we've all often talked about this how they need to uh, you know get that basket into different other and they're looking at artificial intelligence they're looking at the other uh you know service other sector aspects. Yeah. yeah but at the same time i think us um has as, as i said not only because of the ready government industry but us and bangladesh have had a close relationship for a variety of reasons. Uh, if you recall, this was a couple of years ago in Bangladesh launched its Indo-Pacific Outlook, uh, which was certainly, I'm sure, something that US would have encouraged it to do. So clearly, Bangladesh has a vision where it also, you know, uh, is working in what Bangladesh US sees in terms of what the region offers. So Bangladesh clearly positions itself on, you know, at that space. But uh, in the recent, especially in the last election early this year in January, when we saw that Bangladesh was heading towards a kind of, a, again, a one-sided election. And I remember USA making some very strong uh, voices it's against that. You remember there's a sanction that was brought in against RAB. There were threats of other sanctions if the election was going to be one-sided. So there has been that little complication about that. But I think uh, US's interest in South Asia is something which is going to be enduring and sustainable. And Bangladesh is also part of the Indo-Pacific Bay of Bengal, uh, you know, the growth story that they're looking at in terms of uh, developing a more partnership in the region. So you, you described the fact that the U.S. was not happy with the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, but Professor Yunus seems to have many friends in the United States who have protested his prosecution at the hands of Hasina. How do you see the U.S. role play out in Bangladesh where we understand that China has substantial state? Not that we compete against China, but I also oh, want to get your reaction. What do you think about it? U.S. and Bangladesh will continue to work together. And the very fact that you mentioned Professor Yunus has friends who support him from U.S. So I think U.S. would like to see Bangladesh 
uh, go back to a multi-party democratic uh, nation. Right. Uh, not which a two-party is, system. Yes, not Led the two-party two system. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, that, that I think, break, everybody wants to see that. But, uh, and it's, Without, I mean, of course, that we know at this point of time, we've seen uh, former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been, uh, has issued a couple of statements, which is, uh, you know, she's alleging that it was thanks to, it was the US who's been behind this particular uh, right. movement and all of that. But uh, hope, without going I hope, in. I hope that's not the case. I, 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 I wouldn't think so, but uh, I mean. But you never how, know. <laughs> <laughs> whatever I, I i leave it there i, I but I, I i that's what i'm saying that there is a long term interest that both will work together but at the same time i would like to mention that china is actually the one who has far greater stakes in south asia as well as bangladesh and over the years not only uh, has ever since 75 when post uh, uh, mujib that china recognized bangladesh from that time to now china has been not only their greatest the the strongest defense partner but in terms of the growth story the infrastructure development much of what has you know positive uh, um, infrastructure development and other things that has happened in bangladesh has been very ably supported by china uh, while of course there are many questions about the kind of you know uh, the funds which has been used the kind of loans credit it's, bangladesh is facing challenges in terms of a debt servicing now but it's not necessarily because of the problem of china but uh, because of endemic corruption, many of the infrastructure projects, if you look at the budget, it's double usually of what, you know, the similar, you know, infrastructure development that's taking place in other countries in South Asia, in India inclusive. So those are the things which are now coming out in the open. There has been some uh, talk about it on and off. So those issues will be addressed. But China is one particular country who's been able to very effectively work with across the leaders. It doesn't matter who's in Dhaka, whether it's a BNP-led government, it's a you know Awami-led government, they have always been able to work effectively. And in the last few years, we've seen China being an extremely close partner. I don't expect anything to change, irrespective of who comes in now. Uh, as we know, across South Asia, they have worked very effectively with whoever is in the seat of uh, power. And with the interim government or with the next elected government, China is uh, is going to be, uh, you know, engaged just as much strongly as they were in the past. So they will be a major player, China. Of course, there's no doubt on that front. Well, China and India don't get along, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they don't. Yeah. And I, I, in fact, think that it probably works in favor of many of the South Asian neighbors, uh, because also having India as a strong, you know, partner uh, also is a messaging to China, right? That, uh, and I think that's exactly what India, Bangladesh should be working on, that while they build and they continue to build on the robust partnership that India and Bangladesh has had over the several decades. Similarly, they would also, and I think, um, uh, while many are questioning whether Bangladesh is going down the way with Sri Lanka has in terms of debt servicing problems, uh, I think Bangladesh has been a little more cautious. There has been issues, but that's more of a corruption-led issue. But Bangladesh will continue to work closely. And I think having the two partners is a is a good balance for both of them. And there's no doubt about having the fact that... Partner, which, is India, China, which is India and China. India and, India China. and China. And both of them in their own different ways have contributed to okay. Bangladesh's growth story. So why would they lose out on both these uh, very, uh, I think, uh, you know, friendly partnership that they've enjoyed on both Do sides? Do you have a confidence in Mohammed Yunus, uh, political party, that he will be able to sustain the law and order and, re and retain the, what I consider the fair and free election? I have a lot of hope, yes, on Professor Yunus because <laughs> you know of what I he know is. him but personally. I, mean, I met him. Yeah, a couple times. I don't, but I, I, I mean, I don't know about. I mean, he of course doesn't have a political experience in that sense. I mean, he everybody in it, particular well, new... interim government, you know, is inexperienced in terms of political uh, experiences. Right. But so there is an issue of you know the aspiration and the ambitions of the youth. And how are they, how will the interim government be able to, do they have the capacity, you know, you need capacity, you need wherewithal, you need systemic uh, changes, you need a proper structure to be brought in again. And, uh, you know, so it's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be an easy task for uh, anybody at that uh, uh, point. And Professor Yunus, of course, is a person that I think in Bangladesh, everybody looks up to. He's yeah, aspirational. Well, 
He's he was aspiration. the fellow who established the micromanagement. Yes. So, I mean, I think there's lots of hopes uh, pinged on him. And I'm, I'm quite confident that he's not going to disappoint his own uh, countrymen and all of us <laughs> who are watching him closely. I really yeah. hope on that. But it's it's a it's a huge challenge. And, you know, this interim government looks right. really large. So I'm not sure. But I just hope that they don't play on the rhetorics, which they seem to be in the last couple of days, if I've noticed. And... It seems there are some elements who are playing a far stronger role than we expected to. And I'm referring here to BNP and some of the Islamists. Some of the things that's come brought to our notice, what is happening, is something I think this government has to rein down, you know, kind of control that. Because uh, you can't let Bangladesh go exactly what you had uh, wanted to change. Uh, if you're, you know, the same political retribution, the same rhetoric, the same, right. Uh, right. you know, that, that, is not what we expect from this. And I, but again, I'm very confident that the youth will ensure that uh, one sheds those kind of uh, unnecessary loud noises, which are not required, but, you know, moves Bangladesh on a journey, which is uh, about stability and growth and peace. I was told uh, Muhammad Yunus was the fellow that went to the Hindu Hindu. Uh, and saying that you you live, we have to live in peace and harmony together rather than fighting against each other. And I thought that was a good move on his part. Absolutely. I mean, especially in the aftermath of the violence that took place against many of these, um, you know, Hindu structures and Hindu families. Uh, I think he visited Which is temple. Wrong. And Which is totally unacceptable to, uh, to anyone, including the yes. United States. Yes. So, uh, which is, uh, which is, I think, uh, his move to go visit temple, talk to the uh, many right. families uh, was certainly in the right, uh, I think, a very good positive step forward. And I think it conveyed a very strong message that, and uh, that I think Bangladesh should be a land of amity. It should be where everybody coexists. Right. And uh, I don't see why it can't, because everybody uh, would contribute in their own particular way that to the development correct. of the nation. Tell me a little bit about the Bangladesh is, is in terms of geography. It's right next to the West Bengal, correct? Yes. And it's a population. Is what, How much is the population of the Bangladesh? Uh, about 140 million. 140. And how much? How many people are minorities there in, in Bangladesh? Uh, the in, Hindu minorities are about 8%, so tentatively oh, 8%. So that's fairly so high. 13, 13 million, yeah. Yeah, that's fairly high. And they have to coexist, as you, as you suggested. And uh, also, uh, I wanted you to tell me a little bit more about Bangladesh before we depart. Do you have anything to say? Uh, no, I'm saying that Bangladesh right now is going through a crisis. Political challenges. The Challenge. crisis is not, is not over. And I think, as I said, uh, you know, some of the unsavory incidents which has been brought to our notice, I think the whole world is watching, uh, mm -hmm. is something that we hope that, you know, the interim government will be able to clamp down on and ensure that what is what they want to do. They actually want to ensure that what the problems the Bangladesh faced in the last 10 or 15 years, it's something that they can move away from and, you know, introduce a far more uh, a different uh, Bangladesh again, bring back the Bangladesh that they dreamed of, the Shonar Bangla that we often talk about. Well, Bangladesh used to be part of Pakistan, as you all know. 